Welcome, Wargamers, to the Eightfold Paths of the Mortal Realms, because today we are continuing our talk all about the Slaves to Darkness. And in my last video, we introduced the faction kind of for folks who were brand new to the game or just wanted to get excited about the army. From whence they come, what they're all about, some of their key characters in terms of Archeon and Bellicor, and kind of what the overall faction represents and, and kind of its place within the story. But in today's episode, we're going to push forward into the new stuff because, as we'll talk about, the Slaves to Darkness, specifically Archeon himself and Bellicor, were both making some major plays towards the end of the last sort of story arc that Age of Sigmar had. And for a lot of time, there was kind of just dead silence on that front. And this book punches that story a little bit further forward, or at least gives us some resolution to the events of those campaigns. So I want to cover that. The plot is thickening, and I am very excited. Now, one thing I'd like to add before we get into that is I want to shout out Not Just Gaming, an awesome store over on the East Coast in the United States. They have 15 to 30% off a whole wide swath of projects from Games Workshop stuff all the way to major hobby product brands. So if you're looking to start a new army or just expand an existing project, please consider using that affiliate link down below because every time you do, it goes directly to supporting me, my wife, our cats. It's life-changing stuff every time and thank you so much to everyone who's used it already. Okay, so if you are just jumping in uh, to the kind of grand story, I'm going to assume you watched the first video and skip the recap there. If you're just tuning into the overall story of the Mortal Realms, Archeon found a way to possibly get into Azir. He's been mining a resource called Veronite out of the uh, eight points, and this has like a just raw chaos. Think of like um, Realmstone for hell, constantly warping and mutating and twisting anything it touches. He wants to essentially melt a whole bunch of it down and just like melt away the gates that open to Azir so he can march his forces in there and, and go take on Sigmar man to man. Well, that process was interrupted by the forces of Stormcast and Marathi's Daughters of Cain uh, in the beginning of the Broken Realm series. Marathi ascended to godhood and that plot point was kind of largely forgotten. The only real other significant thing that we got from that story was as Stormcast were dying in the eight points, the forces of chaos began to kind of summon some weird dark cloud above them that the souls of Stormcast could not pierce through to go back to Azir. So they found a way somehow within the eight points to perma kill Stormcast, which is very good information to have. And so that plot thread went through at the first book, the, the Broken Realms Marathi, but the Archeon story, or at least his side of it, kind of ended there. It was kind of left in the lurch. We'll come back around to that. Uh, the other thing that happened in the Broken Realm series featured Bellicor. This is when he got his Mamma Jam a new model that is just absolutely stunning. And he went on a bit of a side quest. Bellicor, the Dark Master, the first demon prince, is basically saying, how can I dethrone Archeon, while at the same time, because this is required, at the same time gaining the favor of the Chaos Gods again. Because if he just kills Archeon, he just has to crown a new champion, but he has to redeem himself simultaneously. Well, throughout the Broken Realm series, Bellicor learns a bit of things. One of them is that if you start a large enough magical detonation at a realm gate, what you can actually get this thing to do is trigger a kind of a secondary explosion at a nearby realm gate. You can chain detonate them. And so his big old plan in Broken Realms Bellicor was he essentially took out one of Archeon's most important structures that's out there, a silver tower where they gaunt summoner of Zinch inside. It's how Archeon communicates, we force these things in the future, plots and schemes, these guys are a vital part of it. He detonates the entire thing with Archeon's wizard inside at a realm gate. Bellicor, in the background, has been kind of gaining forces within the ranks of demons, saying, yeah, we're, we're all part of the Slaves to Darkness faction. We, we all have that keyword, guys. What I'm looking to make you do is just put a little decal of this symbol of me instead of Archeon on your armor. And some of the demons were like, all right, I do like you more than him, and we're all on the same side, so why not? That's an oversimplification, of course, but he gets like a pocket group of people who are loyal to him rather than Archeon. What he does is then sends these forces out into other nearby realm gates to detonate them. 
by detonating a whole bunch of these things with so much arcane power as a silver tower and all the realm gates individually, he essentially sets off a cascading effect where realm gates are just annihilating themselves. Like think of a nuke going off every, I don't know, a couple hundred miles or something. I don't know how close they all are. And what it does is creates so much pandemonium and so much chaotic energy that that same dark cloud that existed in the eight points begins to settle over most of, certainly it starts in Chaman, the realm of metal, and then exudes outward. And now the Stormcasts are having a lot of trouble getting back to Azir. Belakor then went, and I believe it was the city of Vindicarum, because it's Celestial Vindicators. If I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm yeah, wrong in the chat. But he goes to that city to try and conquer it. He's staved off at the last moment, but I mean, the city is, is functionally dang near destroyed. And everything kind of ended sour for the Stormcast. This was definitely like an Empire Strikes Back moment of the bad guys just won. But within that, we have a few plot threads, and we're going to pick up on those starting now. The first one I want to talk about is Bellacor, because I believe his plan and his sort of determination and his willingness to act got way more showtime than Archeon's thing. I just feel like Archeon's thing was a background project. He wasn't even, like, really there a whole lot. I mean, it was a side thing to get Marathi into the Eight Points. So there's not a whole lot of, like, fleshed-out information about that. All we know is his mind got destroyed, and that's really about it. But Bellacor got a whole dang book. And what we learn from this new battle tome post the Broken Realms sequence is that Bellacor's ranks, that is to say, Slaves to Darkness units that revere him over Archaeon, even though they're all on the same team, the people who pledge a loyalty to Bellacor are rising in staggering numbers. In fact, it has said that a lot of the inner circles of Varengard, which is Archaeon's, I don't know, most trusted thing. Why is this? Why is everyone flocking to Bellacor? Well, Archaeon is a man in high demand. He can't be everywhere. In fact, that's like his one foible and why the Gaunt Summoners are so important is they can project and, and kind of coordinate his will across massive distances. But there are a lot in the uh, the Varengard, his top circles, that are getting despondent over the fact that he's just not around. I thought I was going to rise through all of this to follow Archeon the Ever Chosen on the battlefield, but he rarely does that. He kind of swoops in, knocks something out, and then is so busy he has to go to the next fight, and so on. So there's already people who are unhappy about this, like they feel like, why are we not just walking immediately towards like Hammerhall or something? Who cares about Azir? They're walking on our ground, let's go fight them there. They have a gate to Azir inside of their city. Let's go just do that. And so when Bellacor made his little power play, even though at the time his forces were almost purely demonic because Bellacor can exist in the realm of demons and, and kind of communicate to them easier and more secretively than mortals where Argeon can see or hear, now their ranks are getting filled up with mortals who are discontent with Archeon's leadership and they see Bellacor out here making major plays. Hey, we're all on the same team, but why is the number two guy the one leading the charge here? How come he's the guy who's making real moves? He detonated all these so, um, realm gates. There's now like a huge cloud of chaos energy and everyone's getting really invigorated by it. Things are getting darker, but also like, of course, in their perspective, better. I need to go follow him instead. This is clearly a champion. Now, one such character who made this decision is actually a new war scroll that we get to play with. It's a named character named Eternus, Blade of the First Prince. And he is sort of like the champion of Bellacor. Like if he had like a right hand man, it would be Eternus. This is a former Varengard. So this was one of Archeon's most trusted, loyal, down to the wire, true followers. He is a warlord in his own right of a hundred nations and all this other crazy, you know, grandiose things that they describe Varengard as. And he got so sick of seeing Archeon run around and do errands that he's like, I'm going to go follow Bellacor. Bellacor is like, I would love to have you get in on the ground floor. And so not only is he the chosen champion, like he's out there leading wars and things like that for the forces of chaos and Bellacor, but also he is a form of evangelist. Bellacor has already given him immortality as just a gift from a demon to a mortal, so he doesn't need to worry about the clock ticking, 
But to keep that mortality, he has, of course has to keep Bellacor happy. He does this by going around to the various forces of chaos, strongholds in every realm, and saying, hey, you should really take this decal of the first prince and put it on your shoulder. It doesn't mean you're any less chaos, just join us. And so with him as sort of, like I said, the, the evangelist going around, he's a warrior prince, he's an embodiment of everything that these various warbands are trying to achieve. He's a Varengard, and he's coming to you and saying, we have a new leader. Now, one thing I will criticize the book at is that it kind of leaves it this note of, this is going on, but Archeon hasn't either seen it or hasn't responded to it, which is kind of like a letdown. I want him to be very much like against it. Although the section about Bellacor ends with that by going around and, and actively proselytizing to Archeon's inner circle to point out he did convince most of the eighth circle of Archeon's Varengard to defect or at least pledge some level of loyalty to Bellacor. He's, he's declaring war. Right, you can't take from Archaon. So it's like an impending thing. Their duel will probably be settled at some point in the next campaign series. But for right now, it's kind of like, this is coming. There is a internal Slaves to Darkness Civil War, a Bruin, with two incredible characters. So that's the events as we know them. Like I said, there's very little about Archaon, his overall plans going down right now. All we really know is that he doesn't know about Eternus yet, and his grasp on power is dropping like his his status within i guess his own ranks is going downward because he's not staying anywhere to lead in fact uh, the reason he was able to i guess kind of lose the loyalty of the eighth circle of varengard is he took them all to gur and basically said um nothing's going to change here you guys stay here and conquer the realm i'm going to peace out and he left so there are like jilted lover syndrome everywhere in the slaves to darkness faction this is the perfect place for these divisions, these cracks of loyalty to start forming. Because the forces of chaos are all about this, new warlords usurping the older ones or the previous ones. Even if Bellacor's story is a bit more complicated, ultimately every single champion within the ranks of the Slaves to Darkness is trying to grow in power and one day wants to be the one in charge. Which eventually means getting rid of Archeon. But between abandoning his troops in various places all the time, and this whisper that Archeon wants to kill the Chaos Gods when so many of his ranks are filled with people who literally revere them as deities, there's some dissonance, and so it's brewing. And so I really do think, uh, in, you know, this is total speculation at the time of recording, but I think the next chapter for Age of Sigmar is going to feature the Order versus Chaos narrative a lot more, even, even if it's set in Gur, Realm of Beasts, which is a lot of orcs and destruction stuff. Because I believe that this book is setting up a, a duel between the two champions, or at least a clear indication of a subplot that Belcor and Archeon are going to come to a head, and that might leave room for our heroes, the Stormcast and Cities of Sigmar, to triumph a bit more. Whatever the case, I absolutely love the story. I thought they did a, a great job of making other characters in the faction seem really important. To me, Archeon is a very suffocating character. And I guess right at this point I can say we're kind of moving into the why is this cool. But whenever Archeon's on a scene, he dominates the entire thing, but then he has to run. Like he's He just never stops, and nor do we see him stop long enough to feel like he's a major character. He doesn't get a ton of dialogue. He doesn't get a lot of introspection or anything like that. Bellacor we actually have. Broken Realms Bellacor, he had great dialogue with Lady Olander, he had plots and schemes in motion, he's working with other people rather than just lording over them. He has to actively try to recruit rather than Archeon, whose sheer presence and might is just supposed to get everyone to follow him. They are different approaches, and I like them. They are both reflections of what it means to be a Chaos Warlord. And for you and I as players, you can, in real model ways, lean into either one of them, and that's terrific. One of the reasons I don't like named characters that are on a deity level, which I, I'll call Arche on a deity level, just, you know, given the physical size of his model, how much of a army change it is to have him in your list versus not, all that kind of stuff. He's a centerpiece thing. And I, I don't hate models like that, but I, to me, there has to be an alternative, someone who's not quite truly deific. And so having a subplot where there's a smaller hero, still a named character, that's cool but some other narrative tension within that story. So it's not just always defaulting to what's going on with one particular character as if the character and the faction are synonymous. That's what I like. Give me some choices. 
So any friends, I would love to hear your thoughts. What do you think about the kind of the Slaves to Darkness arc that they're moving towards now, where Bellacor is becoming more and more of a prominent character again, and uh, maybe a little bit of drama between him and Arkan? What would you like to see? Who would you pledge loyalty to? For me personally, I'd go Bellacor. I don't think Archeon does enough personally. I think uh, Dorgar, his ride, is the true champion of chaos. And uh, once Dorgar eats Archeon and Bellacor, he will ascend to becoming the perfect creature. That's my hot take. But barring that inevitability, I'm going to say uh, Bellacor is my favorite because I like his use of magic and subterfuge. I find that to be more in line with a lot of the tenets of chaos rather than strictly martial prowess, which is Archeon's one trick. He's good at war, but we're doing more than war. We're corrupting a realm. We're bringing hell with us wherever we go into the hearts and minds of men and the realms abroad, and I do think Bellacor does that better. Let me know your thoughts. Defend the Ever Chosen down below if you dare. I'll respond to you there. Thank you so much for hanging out today, and I'll catch you in my next Age of Sigmar lore video. Happy Wargaming.